So I, I, I want to begin by thanking Karishma and the Tipoi team um, and the Creative Morning Program. They have a whole bunch of local partners. It's a wonderful uh, program. Of course, my, my uh, co-founder, Om Shiva Prakash, uh, who runs this scan center here. We've been working together for a decade. Um, and of course, the uh, Gandhi Bhavan for giving us such a beautiful home to work out of. Um, so I'm going to talk today, our, our, our theme is vision, right, vision, and I'm going to talk about vision and, and making your vision real. And so I'm going to talk about two efforts. Uh, one is the servants of knowledge and our vision of a public library of India, right, a bottom-up, grassroots public library of India. And then I'm going to talk about edicts of government. Edicts of government are the law and legal materials issued in the name of the state, right, so parliamentary laws. But it's much broader than that, things like the Indian Building Code. And then I'm going to talk about some lessons that we can learn from history on how to make a vision real. Uh, because we stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, and so I, I'm going to talk about some of those folks and then open it up for discussion if we still have time available. Uh, the, the problem is that knowledge um, has been colonized right now. It's, it's hidden behind walled gardens. Um, we're in an era of what I call the East India Company stage of access to knowledge. Um, and I'm going to give you four examples of why I, I believe this is the case today. Uh, so example one is scientific knowledge, which is just totally locked up behind paywalls. Companies like Reed Elsevier, uh, Oxford, Cambridge. Um, and it's behind paywalls. It's very high prices. Uh, so if you're at a university, even the best universities, JNU or IISC, you cannot get the materials that you need in order to further your education and do your research. Now, there's a number of efforts countering that, and they range from Sci-Hub, which is a pirate site with 87 million articles, they're being sued in India, and, and there's other efforts such as the open science movement, which is trying to work within the system and change it. So many foundations are now requiring that if they fund your research, you must make it open access. So there, there's a variety of approaches to making that information. So that's example one of scientific knowledge, and it's the most egregious. Um, but uh, there's some other examples of how knowledge gets colonized. Um, in the 1960s, there was something called PL 480, Public Law 480. And the PL 480 program was known as Food for Peace. And this was a time of famine in India. And so the US passed this bill that allowed India to buy grain at subsidized prices and pay in Indian rupees, so pay in soft currency. Now, two things happened. <laughs> One is that when they shipped the grain over, it also included Congress grass. And so they not only did they give you grain, they gave you asthma, um, <laughs> which is significant. And, and not only that, the US, by allowing uh, India to pay in rupees, found itself with a big pile of Indian rupees. And they were like, what should we do with this money? And so they started buying Indian books. They bought every government book possible. Um, they bought a whole bunch of other books. And that means that if you're a scholar and you're trying to research like the Indian government from the 50s and 60s, you need to go to the University of Chicago because that, 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 they have the better collection of, of those books. But the US did something else. This was the era of the Cold War. And Russia played this game as well. And what they did is they started shipping subsidized books over to India. They worked with Indian publishers um, and they made the books really cheap. And it was everything from literature, you know, it was American literature or Russian literature. So Russia sent over Tolstoy and we sent over Mark Twain. But it was a whole bunch of textbooks as well. And it wasn't the latest textbooks, it was the old textbooks. And so what that meant is if you were an Indian professor and you wanted to write a textbook and you went to a publisher, they said, nah, too expensive. We'd have to pay you royalties. Uh, we can get these cheap books. And so the, 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 PL 480 program and, and the Cold War on, on the hearts and minds of the people decimated the Indian publishing industry. They made it really hard for Indian publishers to, to survive. Now, they, they have since revived and are doing things, but um, it was a big issue. And in our modern world, what we're finding is a lot of books and knowledge are now behind paywalls, not, not just scientific knowledge, but legal information, uh, literature. And so libraries are forced to deal with companies like ProQuest and EBSCO and companies of that sort. And then finally, my fourth example of information being colonized is if you look throughout India, there is such deep reserves of, of 
books in Indian languages. And there's a lot of scanning in the West. There's Google Books and stuff, but you know, they're scanning English books, maybe French, maybe Spanish, but they're not scanning books in Gujarati, and they're not doing Tamil, and they're not doing Kannada, and they're not doing Hindi or Sanskrit. And, and so there's a need, um, if, if we want to see a public library of India, um, to do something here. And that's one reason why we're here. And, and we think there's a better way than you know, big corporate top-down programs. Uh, Gandhi said, go to the villages. So we, we go to the desktops, right? Where our vision of a public library of India is distributed bottom-up grassroots. So we scan here, but eventually we want to see everybody learning how to scan and scanning their books. And, and if we don't do it here in India, it's just not going to happen, right? There, there's, um, there's millions and millions of Gujarat books, for example. There, there's so many Canada books. Um, and it's just got to be done here in the country. So our vision is, is a big one. And we've been doing this for 10 years now. Uh, is first, it was a volunteer effort. Um, my, my NGO, Public Resources, a US-based nonprofit. And I hired some commercial contractors here to, to do some scanning and things. And we had volunteers. Um, and, and at first, I was just buying books here in India, I'd go to government bookstores and other places, and I'd bring them back home and we'd scan them. And one day I was seeing a guy named Mohandas Pai, you may know his name. I told Mohan, I, I had 100 kilos of books I was bringing back to the US to scan. And he started yelling at me, he said, why, why are you scanning them in the US? Why aren't you scanning them here? What's wrong with you? And I explained these were very high-end scanners that we were using, very high resolution, protected the books. And so I went to my friend Brewster Kale at the Internet Archive and I said, give me a scanner. I want to ship it to India. And he was like, oh, no, 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 don't do that. You'll, you'll do it wrong. These are difficult to operate. Just ship us the books. They have a scan center in the Philippines. And I was like, Brewster, I can't go to an Indian library and say ship your books to the Philippines. That's not going to work. Um, and, and so we got a, a scanner shipped over here. Um, and we had been working with the Indian Academy of Sciences. And we went to them and said, hey, can we put a scanner in your basement? And so they gave us the back of their auditorium as our, as our first scan center here in India. And we scanned a whole bunch of science books because we had an MOU with the Indian Academy. Uh, for example, uh, one of the CSRI uh, institutes specializing in food technology. And we scanned 2,000 of their books. But we also started bringing in Kannada literature and Malayalam literature and other things and scanning that. Uh, we got two more scanners given to us. Um, but they got stuck in customs for a year. Um, and then COVID hit. And at that point, Om Shiva Prakash and I were like, this is just not working. And so we started making our own scanners here in India. Um, and we do that now. We, ma we make them here. Uh, we put the electronics on them. So our scanners are very high end. They're, they're very nice frames. They have two high end cameras on them. Uh, you, you hit the pedal. It brings the book up to the glass, takes pictures. You let the pedal down, and you can then turn the page. And when you get good at this, you can do 500 to 800 pages an hour. Uh, we scan 12 to 15 lock pages a month, right? And 1.2 to 1.5 million pages every month. Um, so th this is very high end. And it's not just scanning, right? You, you, you scan it, and then you have to crop the page and de-skew it, make it straight. You have to de-warp it, right? Because the, the, the page is curved, so you need to flatten it. You need to run it through optical character recognition in Indian languages, because many of these books are, are, are non-Western scripts. Uh, so there's a whole workflow. Uh, the other thing we do is we, we started digitally harvesting other books that were already online. So the government of India had something called the Digital Library of India. It was a 10-year effort to scan. They did a really bad job scanning. Um, I mean, there's some pages that got a thumb on there. They're missing pages, and you know. Uh, but I made a copy of that. It was on a rinky-dink government server that has since crashed. And I made a copy, so ironically, we have the only copy of that. And, and that's five lock books. Uh, we also made copies of the West Bengal Public Library, which was very good, of uh, Tamil Virtual Academy, uh, quite a few other electronic sources. And we combined them into single collections. And so now when you search, you're not just searching one collection or another collection. And you can also search inside the book, right? So if you want to, if you got a Gandhi quote you're looking for, uh, you can plug it in for text search. And so this is all on the Internet Archive. Uh, now, some of the stuff that we, we scan is in copyright. Um, 
and we're very careful about copyright. Um, although there is one thing that we do, um, and I do this. I, I don't want to tag anyone else with this, but um, I buy every work of the Indian government I can find. And so I was customer of the year at the publications division in Delhi. I walked out with bags and bags full of stuff. And my rationale is that stuff is in copyright, but our use is non-commercial, strictly non-commercial. Um, the books are sold at a loss. When you go into a government bookstore and buy a book, you know, you can, you can buy a 200-page book, it's, it's 80 rupees, right? They're not making money on these things. Um, and so those books, I, I scan and I make open access. But anything else that's copyrighted, we're very careful. So if you go to the Internet Archive, you'll see over six lakh books that you can access. Um, there were a lot of copyrighted works in the Digital Library of India, and we removed those. They were very sloppy on copyright. They just scanned anything they could find. And you look in, and there's Oxford University Press, you know, year 2015, and so we removed all that. Uh, so we're not actually getting takedowns anymore, but at first we were getting people saying, oh my God, you got my book. And it's like, sorry, and removed them. And so we're, we're very careful on responding to takedowns if, if we made a mistake or someone else did. And then the books that we scan, many of them are copyrighted. So we started at the Indian Academy of Sciences. Um, when COVID hit, we had one scanner in Mangaluru where we were scanning 5,000 Konkani books at the Vishwa Konkani Center. We had another one at the Roja Muthaya Library in Chennai, scanning Tamil books. And when COVID hit, it was just too hard to keep those staffed. And so we consolidated our scanners here in India, uh, in Bangalore. And we approached the National Law School of India University and said, how about if we scan your entire library? And one week later, we had an MOU with the vice chancellor. We put our scanners on site. We had built more scanners. Um, and then we have scanned about 34,000 of their books. We, we've done the complete library. Uh, we're also scanning with Azim Premji University. Uh, we're scanning Lalbagh right now, all 7,000 books in the Lalbagh Botanical Gardens. Uh, we've scanned the entire Gandhi Bhavan Library. So after we were done with National Law School, um, Gandhi Bhavan approached us and said, can you scan our library? And we said, sure. And so we, we were up in a very small little library. We put our scanners in there. And we were making more and more scanners. And we finally approached them. And we said, this beautiful large room um, is empty. You're not really using it. Could we have it? And they were gracious. And they, they gave us this very large facility that we're in now. And, and so we, we're continuing to work. Now, if the book is in copyright, Here's what we do with it. We can make it available to anybody in the world who is blind or print disabled, right? That's an exception to the copyright law. So copyright is, is a balance between the rights of the author and the rights of society. And the Indian Copyright Act has a series of exceptions, and one of them is for the print disabled. So any book, even if it's in copyright, the latest novel, you can make it available to somebody who's blind. You can make books available that are in copyright for the purpose of research, right? So if professors writing a book, doing research, you can give them a copyrighted book to use. Now, they can't take it and like throw it out in the world for everyone else to use. And then finally, you can use books that are in copyright in the course of instruction. There, there was a very famous Delhi University copyright case in which the uh, professors would put course packs together Right? Course packs are series of readings, um, and then the students would buy the course packs. And they were sued by Oxford, Cambridge, Francis, and Taylor, and said, oh my god, that's a copyright violation. Uh, Justice and Law in the High Court of Delhi wrote a beautiful opinion about how this exception was, no, it, it was a course of instruction, was an exception to copyright. This was not a, is it fair, how much of it are you using? It's, is it in the course of instruction? So the, the question under Indian law is, what is the purpose of what you're doing. And so for all those books, we can make them available for those limited purposes. So recently, um, there was a, a large conference here at Gandhi Bhavan. It was the 75th anniversary of the, the Gandhi Smarak Nidhi program. And we had all the Gandhi Bhavans from all over India, and the various ashrams were all here. And we presented all 11,700 books from the Gandhi Bhavan Library to all those other organizations. So it was myself, Justice Hegde, and Minister of Law, um, uh, H.K. Patil, did the presentation. And that presentation came with a caveat. And that caveat was, you are a trustee of this knowledge. You may use it 
for the uses allowed under Indian law, accessibility, research, course of instruction. And so we're taking a whole library. You may know about interlibrary loan. Interlibrary loan is you go to your librarian and say, I need this book, you don't have it. And your librarian you know, calls me up and says, you have this book and we give it and then you give it. So instead of making you ask, we're just giving the librarian the whole Gandhi Bhavan library and saying, use it legally. And we teach a class on intellectual property for librarians. We've taught it five times now. Um, I was just in Delhi teaching one. We've done it here in, in Bangalore several times. And so we're training librarians on, on what their rights and obligations are under the Copyright uh, Act. Uh, there's something else you can do with copyright materials, and we're in the process of standing this up. Um, we're ingesting all of our books into a card catalog, including the text of the books, and we're standing that up as a public search facility, right? So you'll be able to scan all million books. We have all 700,000 of the official gazettes of India. We've got 100,000 copyrighted books. You can search all of them, you know, for a Gandhi quote, for example. Um, and it'll tell you which books are there, and you'll see a snippet. You, know, you, you see this on Google Books, right? You, you can see a snippet. Um, you can see this on the Hathi Trust and the Internet Archive. But we're, we're standing up servantsofknowledge.in. Uh, to allow a public facility. Now, you won't necessarily be able to get the book if it's in copyright, but you'll know what book you're looking for. And you can go to your library and read it there. As you can see, we're sort of pushing the boundaries a little bit. Right? We're doing bulk libraries, uh, but we're trying to be very careful about this. Um, we're a little bit radical on things like works of the Indian government. And you know, not everybody was happy that we did that. We've gotten some takedown notices, and we answer them. We, we send them a letter back and say, here's what we're doing. It's non-commercial. It's for the people of India. Uh, would you like a copy of your documents back? Uh, because in many cases, they haven't digitized them. And so far, at least, we've been OK on that. And, and, but again, the, the, the point is we're being, being very careful on how we do that, very methodical. We're, we're not a pirate library, right? Uh, there are others, like LibGen and others, that, that are pirate libraries. But that's not what we do. Uh, we're trying to change how the system works and do it by, by doing real work. So let me give you the second example. So Vision One, Public Library of India, everybody's scanning their books, everybody's serving their books up, and they're all working together, right? Gandhi libraries form an all-India Gandhi library. Um, law schools all work together to make a National Law Library of India for every law student in the country. Um, and everything gets scanned and preserved and archived. Uh, big vision, very long-term, long way to go on that one, but we're, we're starting. We're starting. Second vision, edicts of government, right? The law and legal materials issued in the name of the state. Now, this is a little more radical. Um, in the United States, in, in any democracy, the law belongs to the people, right? We, we have to know our rights and our obligations. We need to be able to not only read the law, but speak the law to say, the law is no good. I want to change it, right? And, and we need to do that among ourselves. Um, in the United States, and I discovered this a long time ago, many states assert copyright over state laws. And they, they give exclusive rights to those laws to commercial vendors like Lexus and West. And then you have to ask for permission to use them, right? So in order to sign up for Lexus to access the laws of a state like Georgia, you have to agree to terms of use and say, oh, no, 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 I won't download this. I won't use it. I agree you have copyright. Um, and I, I thought that was wrong, and I decided to do something about it. So I bought all 63 volumes of the official code of Georgia annotated. Um, cost me $900, uh, scanned them all, put them online. Did the same thing with a whole bunch of other states, Mississippi, Idaho. And then I sent letters. Sent letters to the Attorney General and the Speaker of the House of Georgia. And I enclosed a thumb drive. And the thumb drive was a peanut thumb drive. It looked like a peanut. Um, you can buy these specialty thumb drives. And I said, you will be delighted to know that the people of Georgia now have access to the official code of Georgia annotated. They were not delighted. Uh, they sent a very nasty letter back saying, you must cease and desist immediately. Uh, Mississippi, same thing. Letters from the attorney general coming to me. Uh, legal liability, you must get rid of this. And in each case, I sent them a letter back. I explained why under the United States Constitution, I cited some court cases, I explained that our use was non-commercial, and then I respectfully declined to remove the materials. Georgia sued me. They accused me in the complaint of a practice of terrorism 
making the law available without permission. And every, every one of these volumes has the seal of the state of Georgia on the cover, and it says copyright, state of Georgia, all rights reserved. And I felt that was wrong. And they sued us, we lost district court. We appealed, we won in the Court of Appeals. They appealed to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court found in my favor. They said the law belongs to the people in a democracy and is not eligible for copyright, right? It's, if you are a state, so in the US, the federal government cannot have copyright, right? It's called the works of government clause. So if you're writing a tourism bro brochure and you're in the Department of the Interior, you can't copyright it. The states can have copyright, but what the court said is if it's an edict of government, it is owned by the people, right? The, the, the judges and the legislators work for the people. They need no incentive to make laws. They're, they don't have the right to copyright these materials. So it's an exception to copyright. It, it's before copyright. Uh, it's, it's the edicts of government doctrine. And what the Chief Justice ruled in, in his opinion, it was a five to four opinion in my favor, is that the people should not be relegated to economy class access to the law. Big victory. However, I still cannot get the official code of Georgia annotated. They stopped making the CDs that I was using. Uh, I can get the books, but the books are old and out of date. Uh, the online current version is hidden behind the Lexus paywall still. And in order to sign up for that, you have to agree to the terms of use. And if I violate those, uh, that's called copyright circumvention. That's a criminal act in the United States. And so even with the Supreme Court opinion, you don't necessarily win. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, there's another example of edicts of government, and that's things like building codes. These are public safety codes. So in the United States, they're made by nonprofit corporations, very richly endowed nonprofit corporations, right? Million dollar salaries for their CEOs, but they're nonprofits. And they lobby intensely because they want these things to be the law. And what happens is every state in, in, in America adopts the National Electrical Code as the electrical code of California or Tennessee. And in many cases, they adopt it wholesale. In some cases, they amend it a little bit. But the entire code is ostensibly copyright. And they're expensive. Right? If you want to buy the, the building codes of California, $1,600. Big stack. You know, I mean, these things are complicated and, and verbose. And so I bought over 1,000 standards that had the force of law. Now, there's other standards that are not the law, but these are incorporated into law. Bought 1,000 of them, and I was sued by six different SDO, standard development organizations. Litigation went on for 10 years. Um, we went to the Court of Appeals, back to the District Court, and then we, we ended up winning. And what the Court of Appeals said is that these are the law. No argument about that. And because they are the law, it is fair use for us to buy them, scan them in their entirety, put them online, and make them available for free download. Now, they, they did say uh, the district court put a trademark injunction against me, which said I can't use their logos. Um, so what that means is when I buy for the six named plaintiffs, their standards, I redact their logos. Right, which is a real pain. In fact, what they're beginning to do is put their logo on every page now. Um, so you have to go through every page. And in some cases, they put a watermark, which is their logo underneath the text. Um, that's OK. That, that's, we can work with that. So we won uh, in the United States. Uh, we had a similar issue in Europe, because I've been doing these building codes all over the world. Building codes, water codes, fire codes, safety of standards, uh, safety of textile machines, uh, safety of agricultural machines, how to use pesticides. These are all subjects covered under these public safety laws. Motorcycle helmets, there's, there's a standard for that in India. Uh, so what Europe does is they have something called um, harmonized standards. And that's the European Commission says this standard is a harmonized standard, and they notice it in their official gazette. And then every country in, in the EU must implement it as national law, right? So once the uh, standard gets, gets notified, you'll see a French version, an English version, a Lithuanian version, uh, you know, and, and you know, they're in English and German. Um, but they, they have the force of law. Um, now, what, what happened is the standards bodies, there, there's two kinds of standards bodies in Europe. There, there's national standards bodies, which are either a government agency or a nonprofit. 
And then there's, a, there's European-wide standards bodies, um, like the Center for European Normalization Standardization, called CEN. And what happens is the EU issues a mandate to a group like CEN and says, I need a standard for this. And they pay them money. 30% of CEN's budget comes from the European Commission. And, and so they're being paid to develop these standards, and then they become the law. Um, so what happened is I had posted the EU-mandated baby pacifier safety standard. Uh, baby soothers, you may know them. And that, that's the thing that the baby puts in their mouth. And the standard says things like, you know, if there's a lip on the pacifier, it needs to be big enough that the baby doesn't swallow the thing. If there's a rattle, it needs to be on the outside, not on the inside. Otherwise, the baby chews through the, the inside part. And so I was sued by the German standards body, DIN. For that one, a bicycle safety standard, I think there was one other one. And we lost in German court. We appealed, we lost. We went to the Supreme Court of Germany, we lost. And so they sued me personally as well as my NGO. And the result was that there is now an indictment out against me, an injunction. If I were to repost that baby standard, uh, it's a 250,000 euro fine. And if I can't pay the fine, it's a two-year jail sentence. So I, I have not reposted the baby pacifier standard, um, to say the least. But we didn't give up. So this was 2013 to maybe 2017. We then went to the European Commission and used their Public Records Act. We asked for four toy safety standards. The Commission said you can't have them. They're copyright. So we went to the European Court of Justice. And the, the lower level of the European Court of Justice, this is the Supreme Court of the EU, said, no, they're copyright. You can't have them. And so the lower court said no. And so we appealed to what's known as the Grand Chamber. Now, they assigned us a constitutional bench of 15 judges, because this is an issue of overriding importance. Uh, we had a four-hour oral argument. Uh, so it was us, uh, an Irish NGO called uh, Right to Know. So I had my Irish solicitor and one German lawyer. And then on the other side, every single standards body in Europe intervened in the case. So it was us versus 15 defendants. And they had 12 lawyers at the table. Um, what the EU court ruled is that there may be exceptions to the Public Records Act, privacy, national security, copyright. But if the issue is of overriding public importance, none of the exceptions apply. And because harmonized standards are EU law, this was of overriding public importance. And so they said they annulled the refusal. The EU then sent us back the four standards in question, but they locked them down. Right? They, they put password protections on them, no printing. They, they said no accessibility, so blind people can't hear them on a screen reader. Um, uh, that do not copy signs all over every single page as a watermark. Um, and they have continued to maintain that, that they have copyrights. So even though we can have a copy, we're not able to share it with someone else. That's their position. I think that's wrong. It's like Lexis not letting me download the official code of Georgia annotated. And so we're probably going to have to go back to court, right? Because these standards bodies feel very, very strongly about, about the whole house of cards will come down if they don't get the money. I think they're wrong, actually. Um, in fact, we showed in the US court that despite my posting the National Electrical Code, their revenues went up. And that's partly because we made them more broadly available, right? More people knew about them. And if you're serious about electricity, you're not going to go to the Internet Archive. You're going to go buy the thing. In India, it's a little different. The Bureau of Indian Standards is a government agency, right? There, there's no question about that. And in fact, their, their executive committee is like, you know, four sitting ministers and a bunch of state ministers and like, you know, a huge list of secretaries and deputy secretaries. Um, and the Indian standards, uh, there's like 19,000 of them. Uh, 4,000 of them are international standards, uh, ISO and groups like that. But 14,000 of them are made in India, because India feels very strongly about they want their own standards and things that are unique. And so I, um, I posted them all, all 19,000. And I sent a letter to the Bureau saying, you will be delighted to know that the standards are now available. We've digitized them. Would you like a copy of the digital versions? And they were not amused. Um, they said, no more standards for you. We will not sell you anything more. Um, so we went to the Honorable High Court of, of Delhi, uh, public interest litigation. I have two Indian co-petitioners. Um, and we sued them, public interest litigation. And that went on for seven years, first time None of the lawyers for the government showed up, meeting adjourned. 
second time, when you sue the Indian government, you sue the Union government and the Bureau, right? So second time, one lawyer shows up. And uh, the, the Chief Justice goes, are you representing the Bureau or the Union government? And, and this is a young lawyer. He goes, well, I'm not sure, Your Lordship. And so they sent him home to find out who his, his client was. Um, so this went on for seven years. And in our last hearing a couple of years ago, we noticed the night before that, that some of the standards in question were available for free download. And we're like, what? And we looked a little closer, and the, the Bureau had decided voluntarily to make all Indian standards, all 14,000, available for free download. Uh, it's obscure. You have to go to the site and register and you know, do the search. And then instead of the buy button, you see the buy button, but you also see the, the download button. And you click the download button. It says this is for non-commercial use, and you may not you know, reproduce them, but you can get the standards. So we went to the Chief Justice and said, uh, Your Lordship, uh, this is what we wanted in the first place. Can we drop our suit? And he was like, get out of here. Uh, we're done. Um, so sometimes you win you know, just by the other side does the right thing. And that's, that's actually the goal, right, <laughs> is, is to have that happen. Um, so those are the, the two visions. They're both very big picture visions. And it's important to understand we're not the only ones that have these visions, right? There's other people doing these things. And for access to knowledge, I, you know, there's Sci-Hub. Um, but for access to knowledge more generally, there's the Internet Archive. Uh, there's EFF, which is a public interest litigation firm. There's people all over Europe, a whole bunch of people here in India that share this vision. And, and many of us have different approaches which is fine, right? We share a vision, and that's no different, as I'm going to explain, by some of the people that, that we learned from. So in our work, there's, there's several things that we practice. So uh, Gandhiji talked a lot about bread labor. And bread labor is daily manual labor. He learned that from the Bible. The Bible says, by the sweat of thy brow shalt thy earn thy bread, right? And he adopted that. Now, actually, that in the Bible is an insult. Um, it, it says, ah, you're going to be forced to do manual labor to make your bread. But Gandhi adopted it as a positive thing. He said, you should do manual labor every day. And that's what we do. So Gandhi did spinning. Uh, we say scanning is the new spinning. And so that's our, our bread labor. Um, we also think it's really important to engage widely, right? Because if we have the vision, that's fine, but we need to explain to others what it is that we're thinking, which is why we teach intellectual property classes to librarians, for example. It's why we give public talks to explain what we're doing. Because at the end of the day, it can't be just us. We're not going to scan every book in India. Right? It's got to be a nationwide movement. And you'll notice that what we're doing is a very long-term effort. right? So this, this Public Library of India thing is over 10 years old now. This edicts of government crusade I've been on, particularly standards, I've been doing that for 30 years now. And we're winning, but the fight continues, right? We, we haven't like totally won. And so the question is, what can we learn from the past? Now, I want to be very clear. I'm going to talk about Martin Luther King and Gandhi. Uh, the work we do is very different from the liberation of, of India or the civil rights movement. Uh, the, we, we don't face personal danger. We may face legal danger on occasion, um, but, but we, we don't have the same situation. But I think you can learn a lot when you look at, at, at these people. So, you know, we begin with Gandhi, of course. Gandhi said, go to the villages. You know, he, he was friends with industrialists, right? He was, he was buddies with Birla. Um, he spoke with the viceroys on, on a regular basis. But at the end of the day, you have to go to the people. Right? And um, you, you have to go out and reach people. Um, Gandhi was amazing at communications. And the way he won the Satyagraha in South Africa was not spinning. It was typesetting and printing. Um, at the Phoenix Ashram, everybody had to typeset every day. Gandhi was prolific about getting information out. And, and what happened is he had a vision that things were wrong in South Africa. But at the end of the day, everyone shared that vision. And that's how they won. That's Satyagraha. It wasn't just because Gandhi said, I want to do it. It's because everyone stood up and said, this is important. Gandhi also taught us that it's important to stand up. It's sneaking around, I, I mean, you can be a pirate site and you can be anonymous, but you're not going to ever win the fight that way. Um, and, and so it's, uh, when he went to the sea to make salt, before he did it, he sent a letter to the viceroy. Dear friend, I'm going to go make salt. You can stop this from happening by, you know, get rid of the salt taxes. And so whenever we put an archive online that might be a little bit controversial, we send a letter to the people that are, are there, and we explain why we're doing and what we did it. You have to have a story. You have to explain why you're doing this. It, it isn't information must be free and a story. Uh, there are people that believe that. 
I don't. I, I think at the end of the day, it's not us that should be publishing the works of the Indian government. It's the Indian government that should be publishing them. Um, it's, it's important to get the other side to embrace the change. Uh, one of the best examples I know of, of Gandhian values is Aruna Roy in MKSS. Uh, what she did with the Right to Information campaign was absolutely spectacular. She went to the villages, literally went to the villages, moved into a village in Rajasthan, spent a decade, ended up getting the RTI Act passed. My friend Sam Petroda, um, he uh, decided that, you know, he invented some of the early telephone switches in the early 1960s, made a lot of money. And he could have come to Mumbai and Delhi and built big exchanges for large corporations. But he decided it was more important to put a telephone in every village. And he went to see Indira Gandhi. What, what he did is he asked for an appointment with the prime minister. And you know, he wasn't like born rich and you know, it wasn't like he knew them. And he got a call back from the PMO saying, you can have 10 minutes. And Sam said, no, 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 that's not enough. I, I, I demand an hour. And uh, the secretary's like, uh, and went back and he got a call a month later, said, okay, you can have your hour. And he convinced Indira Gandhi that a telephone in every village was something to do. And, and you know, that's how the internet is built, right? It isn't big corporate, it, today it's big corporate switches, but in the early day, it was go to the desktop. And, and the, the core internet protocols are a Gandhian way of doing things. In fact, I, I will put it to you that the open access to knowledge movement, the open science movement, the open internet, those all espouse Gandhian values. If you look at, at Meta today, right, if you look at Google, um, that's the East India Company version of the internet. Um, but, but the core internet protocols are still a Gandhian one. It's still open, open protocols. That was Gandhi. And, and it's important to understand that Gandhi wasn't the only one with a vision. Right, you know, he, he worked with, with, with Tagore and Ambedkar and Patel and Bose and Tilak and Jinnah and they all disagreed on all sorts of things. Um, so there were many people doing things. Uh, Ambedkar is particularly in instructive. So Ambedkar felt that knowledge was power. He felt that education for the Dalits was the key to changing things. And so he fought very hard for access to schools. And, and real access to schools. Not, you can go to school, but you have to sit out on a veranda, right? And you can't share the water. And you can't hear what the, what the professor is saying. Um, you may have heard um, the, this phrase of government of, of, uh, of the people, for the people, by the people. And so Ambedkar had an insight. He, he wrote about how government for the people was what the Raj did, right? They, they thought they were doing it for the people. They made the, made the trains run fast. Uh, but what those trains did is they took the cotton and the indigo and they sent it over to England and you had to buy back the cloth. And, and what Ambedkar said is you needed government by the people. And it's why he fought so hard for seats in the legislative assembly. It's, it's why he became a lawyer. It's why he fought hard to you know, work on the law and change the law. And, and that's a lesson I've, I've learned from reading about Ambedkar that it's important to engage, to, to know the law and know what it is you're trying to change and, and to go talk to the baboos because sometimes you know, they're gonna be on your side. Sometimes they just don't understand. Sometimes technology has changed and you can do things in a different way. And Ambedkar was a huge believer in democracy and you know, he wrote those really stirring words in, in the Constitution which you know, Vinay of course will repeat to you immediately on, on, on demand. But you know, when you look at, at justice, social, economic, and political, liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith, and worship, and equality of status and opportunity, you can't have those without access to knowledge. Right? You can't have a democracy unless the people are able to inform themselves, educate themselves. You can't have equality of opportunity unless you can learn the profession of your choice. And so we can le learn lessons from many others in, in the fights. Nelson Mandela, for example, in South Africa, that is a perfect example of change takes a long time to come, right? That, that Nelson Mandela taught us that and he just stuck with it and he was in a jail cell for decades. Um, but he won that fight eventually. Uh, so in the US, we can learn a lot from our civil rights movement. Um, our civil rights movement started right after the Civil War. So there's people like W.E.B. Du Bois and Frederick Douglass and all that began fighting for equal rights. Um, but one of the people that I take inspiration from is Thurgood Marshall. Um, so the U.S. Supreme Court in 1954 
passed the Brown versus Board of Education decision, which said separate but equal won't do it. Schools must be integrated. Right? Supreme Court, very clear opinion, monumental opinion. Despite that, the schools did not integrate. And Thurgood Marshall and, and his partner, Charles Houston, at the NAACP had over 100 lawyers working on integrating schools, and it took them a decade. It took them a decade, and even then, they're not really integrated, right? You look at our busing controversies. And so they stuck with it and they, they, they distributed, right? They, they didn't wait for that Supreme Court opinion and say, okay, we're done. And I take inspiration from that because I've won two Supreme Court opinions, one in Europe, one in the US, and we haven't gotten what we wanted. And, and so the, the lesson there is you gotta keep on fighting um, and you need to just keep on trying to make that, that change real. The clearest example of vision that I can think of is Martin Luther King. Um, his famous speech you know, of, of I have a dream and uh, those famous words, I have a dream that one day little black boys and girls will be holding hands with little white boys and girls. I mean, that's as clear a vision as you can get. But he knew the change did not come easily, right? So he, he went, in his case, to the south and to the north. Uh, he fought for buses. He fought for lunch counters, right? Fought for schools. So in Birmingham, there was a big fight for equal access. And the sheriff there was a guy named Bull Connor, which was about as racist and vicious a Southern policeman as you can possibly find. And King invested a lot, like in 1962, 1963, in protesting. And what happened is Bull Connor and the Ku Klux Klan made it so that anyone who protested lost their jobs, went to jail, right? It, it, was, it was scary. And King was at, at, um, at a standstill. The, the movement had fizzled out. Nothing was happening. Um, because the people that were willing to jail, to go to jail, had gone to jail. Right? And, and the others were like, oh my god, I, I don't know if I can do this. There was someone else named, um, named James Bevel at the Southern Leadership Conference. And he thought the right answer is get the children involved. And King and even Malcolm X said, oh, no, 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 you, you can't do that. But Bevel didn't believe that. And so one day, so on May 2nd in 1963, there was a standoff outside the 16th Street Baptist Church. There were a whole bunch of adults on one side of the street, and then there were a whole bunch of buses and policemen, and anyone who was going to protest was going to go to jail, and they were just standing there, and it was quiet, and the church doors were closed. And suddenly those doors swung open, and a line of children marching two by two holding hands, singing, walked down those steps. The doors closed, children walked across the street and they were arrested and they were put in the buses. Doors opened again. Children, two by two, singing, holding hands, walked down the stairs, the doors closed, they were put in the buses. All day, that repeated itself. They filled the buses. And then for the next week, the children continued the protests, and Bull Connor set the dogs on them. He had fire hoses, and, and there were pictures all over the United States, and the U.S. was shocked. It was shocked. And that led, that was the breaking point. That led John F. Kennedy to say, enough is enough. We're going to have a Civil Rights Act. And so he announced he was going to go to Congress and pass this monumental legislation. Now, now Kennedy was assassinated later that year, and Lyndon Baines Johnson picked up that mantle, and that was his first thing he did after becoming president. He went to Congress, he twisted their arms and said, you will pass this legislation. And so my message there is you can be fighting forever to do something, and then maybe somebody else is going to come along and solve that problem for you, right? And, and so King said, oh, no, no, we can't get the children involved. But it was the children that brought that, 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 that thing over the top. And, and there's a lesson there. And, and the lesson is sometimes other people solve the problem and you should be glad when that happens. Um, and I, I think my inspiration for that is the Bhagavad Gita, right? And, and it says, never consider yourself to be the cause of the results of your activity, nor to be attached to inaction. Uh, you, you should obey your dharma, right? You, you should do your job, um, but it isn't about getting press, right? It isn't about getting recognition. It's about sitting down and doing your work. And so if you want to see change, you need two things. You need vision, and then you need to do your bread labor and follow your dharma and do your work.
And, and so vision by itself won't do it. And there's a lot of people that grandstand and say, I have a vision, right? That's a TED talk. Um, but but uh, if you put your, 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 your feet on the ground and you do the real work and you stick with it, because any significant change takes at least a decade um, and sometimes longer. So that, that's my message on vision. So thank you so much. Um, so uh, my question is like uh, US after this civil rights and when democracy was formed, how come these laws of copywriting the laws came in first place itself? I mean, because, yeah. Well, a couple reasons. Um, so, a hundred years ago, the only way you could do something was print it, right? And so the idea of cutting a printing contract with the company, uh, part of it is control, right? You know, so the bureaucrats are like, these are our laws. You need our permission to copy them. Um, Despite the, the edicts of government doctrine, is over 200 years old, right? It, it's, it's a common law doctrine, right? It's not a legislative passing. But many states just felt that this was something that they needed to have. And then over time, as the internet you know, made electronic access uh, available, rather than becoming cheaper, so it used to be the books were fairly cheap, and the only one who would buy them would be libraries, and so you were paying a few dollars a book, no big deal. And then they, they all went electronic, and the prices soared. And same thing with the, the safety standards. They, they used to be, you know, somewhat reasonable amount of money uh, to buy them, and paper was the only way to get them, and you paid for it. But on the internet, we have the ability to do things in a different way. Um, and so it was shocking to me that, that, you know, I found there were 26 states that asserted some form of copyright over edicts of government. And they range from jury instructions, right, which are authored by judges, and they're a plain English description of what the law is. It's what you tell a jury, right? This is, if you find these things happen, the person is guilty. Those cost a thousand dollars a volume, and you say copyright, Supreme Court of Kansas, all rights reserved. Um, a dozen states still have copyright on their state laws. Um, it may be inertia, it may be greed. Um, so the companies like Lexus and West, uh, you know, like their revenue streams, and because they have the law, it means that every lawyer in Georgia has to subscribe to Lexus, right? Um, that's the only way that, that you can get the stuff. Um, and they fight very hard, just like the standards bodies fight very, very hard to maintain their monopoly over these revenue streams. Um, and sometimes, uh, so it's an interesting issue because I can explain my side of this in one minute to a, a minister or a secretary or a member of Congress, and their reaction is always the same. It's like, really? That's nuts. Why is it? And I explain the public-private partnership and you know the money and, and all that. The other side, to explain their side of it, it takes them 10 hours, right? Because they have to go, you know, it's a big complicated thing. And at the end of the day, it's we want the money. Is what it, or we want control. But it's usually, it's, it's the money is what it comes down to. So why is it festered? I don't know. Um, on public safety standards, I was the first person to really start fighting on that one. So in the 1980s, I, was, I, I wrote professional reference books about computer networks. I did a three-volume series. And to, to write that book, I had to buy these very, very expensive standards from the International Standards Organization and the International Telecommunication Union. And so I, I've been beating the drum on standards since, since the 1980s. Um, and then I expanded from there to physical world safety standards like motorcycle helmets and building codes and things like that. Uh, but the, uh, the standards bodies do not like this. And in fact, the European case, it was public resource and right to know Ireland versus the commission. Um, it's widely known as the Malamud case. And there's been several seminars on the Malamud case. And there is a task force inside the European commission um, called the Malamud task force. And so they're blaming me on this. It's not just me, right? But, but they've, they've certainly put my name on the thing. <laughs> There is books of law, but that doesn't. If reading those doesn't make me a lawyer, you know. So now, is there is there a certain risk involved in uh, making all of these standards available so freely? Like you said, you know, if I'm a professional, if I'm an architect, I will have building code with me if I'm serious about designing. But if I have the code and I'm I'm not a professional, the way the law is interpreted or the way I'm using the building code can change, and then I'm doing it for revenue because I'm uh, trying to build without, uh, no, but then there's a certain nuanced way that an architect would build. 
as opposed to someone with just... Well, look, so, so first of all, architects have to spend a lot of money buying these standards, um, and many of them are, are small architects. So the, the argument from the standards bodies is don't worry your pretty little head. These are just for professionals or highly technical documents. I don't believe that. I, I've, I've posted thousands of standards. The baby pacifier standard, I explained right the lip. Uh, there's one for um, playground slides, right? Slides that, that children go down, and it says that the slide can be 30 degrees. Right? It can't be more because if it's too steep, the child goes right, you know, down very fast. And then at the end, it has to be 10 degrees, so the, the, the child slows down. Um, so, you know, you may not be an expert on all aspects of this, but, you know, working electricians. So if you want to become a plumber in the United States, you have to read the plumbing code. And that costs $200, right? So you go to school and, you know, you're a poor kid and you want to trade and, you know, boom, you got to spend $200 just to buy the code. Um, so I, I think people are smart. Every database I've put online, I put the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission online, right, all the financial um, reports. And the SEC said, oh, no, no, you can't do that. We have a public-private partnership to sell them. It was a $300 million a year industry. And at the end of the day, they said, you know, the only people that need these are financial professionals. And they got plenty of money. Who needs it? So I put it online. I bought all the data, right, from the public-private partnership, put them on the internet for free. We were getting a million hits a day in 1994 on this. And it was senior citizen investment clubs. It was journalists. It was students that wanted to go work for IBM and wanted to read their annual report. Uh, the US patent database, I did the same thing. I bought every US patent, I put it online. They were making $40 million a year at the time selling patents. The commissioner hated what we were doing. Uh, we put it online, and it was amazing the number of people that, that were able to read these things. So I am a firm believer in the intelligence of people. And maybe some of these things are slightly technical. But you know, if you're the headmaster at a school, you ought to be able to get the toy safety standards, right? If you're a parent, and you happen to be trained as an engineer, and you look at the toy, and you say, I don't think this is safe. If you ought to be able to pick it up. If you're a toy store owner, right, and you buy a bunch of toys from China, and you look at it and say, wait a minute, that, that doesn't look safe. Um, so it, toy safety, one of the rules is if there's a hole in the toy, um, you don't want the child's uh, finger to get stuck in the hole, right? So the hole has to be either big or real small. And there's numbers in the, in the safety standards that say 30 millimeters, 10 millimeters. So um, I, I believe people are smart, and maybe they don't understand everything, but I, I think there's nothing to be had. And, and same thing with the law. The law is very technical, but you ought to be able to read it, right? You know, particularly, you know, particularly public safety laws, you know, like fire exits in hospitals. So, so there's a rule that says you need two exits on each floor, and one has to go to the outside and the other can go like into the courtyard. And that's because if there is a fire, you need to be able to get out two different ways. Um, and as you know, there's, there's horrific instances here in India of fires in hotels and hospitals and, and people getting stuck. And if you're the administrator or, or you know, an apartment manager, you, you ought to be able to pull this stuff up. Or if you're the building inspector, right, and you go out to see someone and you say, no, 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 you can't build your deck that way, right? You're building it at home yourself. You can't do that, and, and you're like, why? Looks fine to me. Um, you ought to be able to give a copy of that building code to the homeowner and say, look, right here, it, it says you, you, you know, if you have an electrical outlet and it's outside, it needs to have GFCI um, uh, protection. Uh, and so a lot of my fans in the US are building inspectors. Um, the other ones are firefighters, because like the fire codes were copyright. And so if you're a volunteer firefighter and you want to show your fellow volunteers the life safety code. Life safety code is about protective gear. It's about keeping yourself safe. Um, at least according to the, the fire codes people, you can't copy it and give it to your fellow volunteers. They each have to buy their own copy. And I think that's nuts. So, Next question. Yeah, thank you so much for such an insightful um, world of archival and so many things. So my question was for you to be here as a professional doing whatever you are. How was your early days? Like, as a child, how were we? What were your thought process? And what led you, or what was the starting point for you to get towards this direction? One led to another, but what was that, that spark that made you strong saying, look, I need to visit this, and I need to see this, attend to this. It needs my attention. Uh, it's, uh, so as a child, I, 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 was, I was a musician. I played trumpet. That's all I did. 
That's all I did. I, I thought I was going to be a professional musician, and I went to, a, I was always first chair where I was, and, and then I went to a very nice music school, and I barely made the jazz band, and I, I was like, I better learn something real. So I, I went to college, and I studied control of business, antitrust economics, regulation of business, and I ended up dropping out of my PhD program because computers were starting to happen. This is about 1982 mini computers, uh, big, big computers, but they, they, were, they were not big mainframes, uh, they, um, and they were still pretty expensive. Um, and then as I started writing books about computers and databases, that's when I, I, I learned about this issue of standards, very expensive, not available. Um, and I ended up actually, um, I, I was so upset by that situation. I, I was like 22 years old and I was spending you know, thousands of dollars buying these standards just to understand how the underlying networks work. Um, so I was able to approach the Secretary General of the International Telecommunication Union and they, they had an $8,000, 8,000 page set of standards, big stack that explained how modems work and stuff like that. And he didn't really know what the internet was but I got an audience with him. So I flew to Switzerland and I went up to the big tower I said, I'd like to put your standards on the internet. And he's like, well, son, I'd be happy to help you with this internet of yours. And um, as I, internet of mine, okay. Um, but the problem is we produce these, we print them in-house, and we print them on a computer, and we lost the source code to our publishing language, um, and we're writing a new language, but now all we have is the object code. Object code is like an EXE file or something. And so, you'll have to wait. And I was like, well, you know, sir, what if you gave us that object code? Maybe we could reverse engineer it and give you back the code to your standards. And he's like, well, I don't see the harm in that. And so he called down to the computer people and they gave me a bunch of mag tapes of, of tape. And I brought it back to the University of Colorado and we did what's called an, uh, uh, an octo dump. So we, we printed every byte, right? You know, it's, it, it looks like nonsense. It's like if you try to pull up a PDF file in a, in a text editor. And then we also got a copy of the printed documents and we sat there on the floor with this octodump and said, well, I, I bet that's an E. Well, I bet that's a paragraph marker. And so we converted the blue book into something called TROF, which is a text processing language, right? Um, and put it on the internet. And I got a call from the, the National Science Foundation saying, Carl, you're using all the international bandwidth on the internet right now. Because everybody was downloading that stuff. And I got a call back from the Secretary General a week later saying, you know, uh, it was actually a fax, of course, uh, saying, we have decided to terminate this experiment on this internet of yours. Please retrieve all copies and destroy them. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll destroy my copy, but cat's out of the bag on the other ones. Um, and so that's what taught me a little bit of activism as to how one might be able to change those situations. So, um, and that, that was, you know, like late 80s, early 90s. So that was kind of my awakening. That, that, and I began working on open government stuff. When I ran the, the, the first radio station on the internet, I also did the SEC and the patent databases, put them online and then basically shoved them back down the government's throat. I, I, with the SEC database, uh, I ran it for a year and a half put a sign on the internet saying this service will terminate in 60 days, right? It's the SEC's job to run it. I'm out of this business. Here's how many hits we got. Here's our source code. Here's how to write a letter to Al Gore, to the Speaker of the House. They both had email. Uh, the, the chairman of the SEC didn't have email, and so we created an email address for him. Uh, we had 17,000 people send notes in. We printed them out, brought them down to the SEC. And the chairman finally called up the Wall Street Journal and said, well, we're, we're going to do this. And then I got a call from the chief of staff, and he goes, you know, you set a 60-day deadline. We can't move in 60 days. We're government. Can you extend your deadline? I said, no, but I'll loan you our computers. So Eric Schmidt was at Sun at the time. And, you know, he later on one did Google. He had given us some computers. So we, we, we took the computer. We donated our source code. We fixed their internet line because it wasn't working. Got them up and running. Now, their computer staff was really pissed off about this whole situation. Right? You know, um, but what happened is when we gave them the database, 
um, they were able to go to their bosses and say, well, first of all, this is a borrowed computer, and we need, we need a real computer. And so they, they got big computers that filled entire machine rooms. Um, and then they found themselves running the most popular internet service in the federal government, and they became huge fans of it. And so again, the, the idea is you, you want the other side to own the victory, right? When, like when the Bureau of Standards started making them available for free, I sent a very nice letter to the director saying, you know, congratulations, now we have not only make in India, we have safe in India. Um, I wrote an op-ed on a prominent blog read by a lot of government uh, bureaucrats uh, praising them and saying this is a good thing. Because at the end of the day, you want the other side to be happy. Um, you don't want to rub their nose in it. So. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. So I have two questions and they're connected. The first one is I was just trying to understand how this whole copyright um, I mean, putting aside the question that the idea of copyright of information that is meant for the public and should be in the public domain is in itself questionable, but how does that really work when you're digitizing these and putting it out for everybody? So, and, and in the process, my second question is that you are actually democratizing, in a way, it's trying to democratize access to information. And you gave us several contexts. You gave us the context of the US and Europe and then a place like India. In your experience and since you've been doing it for a while, to what extent is, has there been any um, reflection on to what extent has it actually democratized that information? Because the contexts are very, very different. There's one thing to say that uh, you hope that people will access it and they will, it will be there. That's the vision, right? But to what extent has it actually translated into action across the different contexts okay. was just I was wondering. So copyright is not an absolute right, although there are what we call IP maximalists that think copyright means I can tell you what you can do with the book you bought no matter what. Any use whatsoever, you need my permission. And that's not how copyright law works. Copyright law is an incentive to the authors and the publishers to make new creative works, and it's balanced with the rights of society to have access to information. It's a balance, right? And the Indian copyright law says you get copyright, right? Life plus 60 years, but there are a series of exceptions. And, and the exceptions in the Indian copyright law, and this will get to the second part of your question, um, are long and they really reflect the unique circumstances of India. The, the fact that access to knowledge is hard and expensive. Um, and so with the copyrighted books, we can't make them available for general use, but we can make them available for research and for course of instruction and for accessibility. And there are some people that don't like that. They say, oh, no, 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 no. I wrote a book. You know, anything you do needs my permission, but we, we believe strongly, and we have written a 200-page book about IP law for librarians in India, um, deep, deep dive into the legislative history, constituent assembly, the court cases. And so it's a balance. And so we are allowed to take copyrighted books without permission of the publishers and scan them, but we need to be very careful on what we do with them. Now the question is, have you had any impact? And, and I, I think related to that is why India? You know, why, why don't I just do this in the US? And I think the Indian Copyright Act is, is an act because of the limitations and exceptions that allows us to do things we couldn't do in the US. So in the US, anything you do is subject to the fair use analysis, which means anything you do, you roll the dice, and maybe you get sued, and it goes to a judge. And the judge looks at you know how much of the work are you using, and are you transforming it? Are you commercial? What's the effect on the market? Whereas in India, there's a series of, of very specific exceptions, such as for print disabled and things like that. The need is more compelling, I believe, here than in the West, although, if you look at Sci-Hub, right, this pirate site, the, the top 10 users of Sci-Hub include China and India and Iran, also includes the United Kingdom and the United States, because even if you're at Harvard University, you still don't get access to the materials you need. Um, so I, what I think has happened is the needle has swung too much to the right on, on the IP 
issue, right? The intellectual property, uh, many of the large publishers have just taken a, a very strong stance and they're attempting to become monopolies in, in various fields. One of the things we found here in Karnataka, and Om Shiva Prakash has been instrumental in doing this, is he knocks on the doors of publishers and talks to authors and says, you know, you, you wrote this book a long time ago, it's no longer in print, how about if we scan it and put it online for non-commercial use only? And they're like, oh, that'd be great. Or my dad wrote a book and it's technically still in copyright. Or we'll go to publishers and say, you know, you got a backlist. Um, so almost able to get permission for 50 years of Custory magazine, for example. And you got it online with permission. Um, we've worked with a number of publishers here. We've worked with Motilal Banarsidas. Um, and, and in some ways, if their old stuff is available, you know, maybe they could sell it, but they probably won't. Uh, but if it's available and we have a link back to their website, maybe somebody will look at it and say, oh, I wonder what else they have. Um, so, you know, there, there's publicity there. It's like when I post standards, I believe the revenues of the standards bodies goes up because more people know what the fire code is. Again, if you get serious about it, you're going to want to buy it at the source and you're going to want the training and the handbooks and you'll join the association, right? And you're going to want yourself certified. The Bureau of Indian Standards, 98% of their revenue is from certification. Because if you sell a motorcycle helmet in India, it's got to be certified. They make 2% of their revenue from selling standards. And most of that is from the international standards, right, from ISO. They were actually losing money on selling the Indian standards because they were pretty cheap. Um, so I believe what we do actually helps the publishers. They don't always believe that. Um, and I, I definitely believe it helps the standards bodies, and they certainly don't believe that. Um, but, but again, I, I believe that the, the, the needle has swung too far, and it needs to be calibrated and brought back. Though the discussion is uh, largely centered on copyrighted works and things, and rightly so, what about other systems of knowledge? Uh, Om was mentioning about the vachana, for example. Nobody in their right minds want to have copyrights over the vachanas. And like that, there are many streams of knowledge which uh, add to the larger conscious uh, knowledge systems. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I, and, and so that's one of the things we really look for. So the copyrighted stuff is interesting, but the, the thing we really specialize in is looking for things that are not available that should be, and there's no question on the cot. Now, the, the issue on the Vachanas is there's editions of the Vachanas put out by, by publishers. So the underlying Vachanas are not necessarily, but maybe the translation um, is. Um, and so, so you, how do you navigate? Well, we, we, we learn a lot about copyright and we look and then we talk to people and we, we look for sources and so we, we do a lot of working with various organizations to um, make the material available. But there's a whole bunch of like old children's literature in Canada and Telugu, so we're working with RBA NMS schools and we've scanned their whole library. Um, and there's a whole bunch of stuff there that isn't copyright. So that, that's a lot of what we look for is stuff that isn't available. We've got 55,000 Sanskrit books, which was Digital Library of India and a few other sources. Um, so uh, if you go to an Indian knowledge program in a university, uh, I, and this has happened to me, um, I, I'll be sent in by the vice chancellor to go talk to them because it's like they need help accessing materials. And I say, so what do you do now? And they go, oh, we use the Internet Archive. And I say, well, I, I uploaded those. They're like, oh, really? Um, <laughs> So I, I think that kind of stuff is really important. And, and so we love doing the old stuff because it's disintegrating, it's going to go away, it's not being protected. The, the super modern stuff, the latest novel by someone, well, you know, we don't care about that. Um, we do, we do want to scan that for the blind, um, but we care much more about that huge archive of public domain materials or out of copyright materials that, that hasn't been preserved, hasn't been accessed. A lot of what we do we put on the internet for the very first time, right? A, a lot of the materials we have were not available before. Uh, so for example, a lot of the Navi Jivan Trust um, pamphlets um, are, are online because of our efforts and, and they, they weren't available. And Navi Jivan Trust obviously was started by Gandhi and didn't believe, and they were the ones that went to the union government and said, don't extend copyright because there was, there was a move to extend the copyright term so that Gandhi's works were protected and they went to the, the government and said, no, Gandhi would not have wanted that. Um, and, and so there, there's a lot of people out there that believe it's a balance. And you know, most people, when they write a book, they're not doing it for money. They're doing it for fame and glory. 
right? They're doing it so they have a book, right? And their family sees it and their friends see it. Most books don't make any money at all. None, 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 none. And so I'm a strong believer in copyright. So Ram Guha, you know, gets copyright. He should have copyright. He earned it. Um, that's good, right? And, and his books are in copyright. Uh, on the other hand, he's a big fan of our work, right? He knows what we do, um, and he likes that. And again, I think it's a balance um, that, that you have to have. So. Well, I have a comment and a question. Mm -hmm. So comment about what you asked. So uh, one example of that is if a common man want to fight his case in court without having a lawyer degree, and he's allowed to do in Indian constitution, I mm -hmm. think. May not be practical, but theoretically it is available. So then if the things are copyrighted and he has to buy that, then it's a big, uh, I mean, um, Obstacle. So yeah, but more likely. So I don't think pro se representation is necessarily a good idea. On the other hand, maybe that's the only. You know, if it's a small parking ticket thing, maybe. On the other hand, even if you're represented by a fancy lawyer, you ought to be able to read the material. So Indian laws are not copyrighted. And in fact, one of our co-founders is Sushant Sinha, who runs Indian Canoon, and he's got all the court cases, he's got all the laws, and we've been pulling out of the official gazettes all the regulations, and so those are available. Now, you know, if you want to buy the latest treatise on contract law that, that someone wrote and wrote for Lexus, that's a different story. Um, but the, the laws themselves in India are widely available. And one question which is very different, that uh, your story is very interesting, your life story. So any Hollywood director approached you for film? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know about that. Um, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, because it's a, it's actually excellent yeah. material for film. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I have written about some of my experiences in my own writing. So I, I wrote a book called Code Swaraj. Uh, Sam Petrota was the co-author. And uh, Exploring the Internet was a travel book about the Internet, but it talked about my ITU story and, and things like that. So I, I, I hope when I'm done with this, um, I can go back to writing books for a living because I really enjoyed that as, as, as something. But now I'm kind of, I'm on my fifth trip to India this year. I have one more coming up in December. So I spent a lot of time on airplanes and I've spent an awful lot of time reading legal briefs and, and things of that sort and working on technical specifications for standards and, and, and scanners and you know camera specs and stuff like that. But um, so right now I got a job, um, but I'm hoping at some point to go back to being a writer. Um, <laughs> Just a very, um, out of curiosity, I was because even as you're speaking, we're speaking about a lot of information or knowledge that is, uh, say, owned by the public servant in different um, contexts. Then we spoke about the more cultural uh, knowledge, which has to be culled out. And then we also spoke about private um, people who have written, written books. I was just curious, I mean, all of this requires a lot of um, background work to understand what needs to be put in there and digitize. So what does your team look like and what are the kind of skills that... Well, there's four of us that are the co-founders of this operation. We have many, many colleagues that we work with all over, but, but the, the core team is four people. Um, Lawrence Liang is the founding dean of the uh, um, Ambedkar University Delhi School of Law. So he created the law school. He's got a, a PhD in film studies from JNU, uh, writes frequently for Hindu, Front Page, many other publications, has a deep, deep knowledge of Indian history and culture. I mean, really amazing. Om Shiva Prakash um, understands not only the Kannada literature in great depth, but is very familiar with literature all over the South. He's been a prominent member of the open access movement, worked on the Wikipedia uh, on, and things of that sort. Uh, and then Sushant Sinha is the fourth member of our team uh, who runs Indian Canoon. And so between myself and Sushant, we've both been deeply involved in making the law available. So neither of us is lawyers, uh, but we've learned an awful lot about the law, uh, particularly in my case because of all the litigation we've done. And so I'm not a lawyer, but I do give lectures on copyright law at Harvard Law School and Stanford and places like that. So. And the students love it because I'm not a lawyer. And my opening line is always, I'm, I, I must confess, I'm not a lawyer. I'm the defendant. Um, and law students like to hear what it's like in the real world. So, <laughs> I have a vague question. And I would just like your comment on it. Um, so today, what we're seeing is that uh, knowledge is abundant, thanks to LLMs. And knowledge is also colonized and gave, gate kept, especially with like scientific and like legal documents. So, what do you think are like the consequences of this, and um, like where do you think like we're going? 
Well, the LLMs are interesting. So I, I know a little bit about, about artificial intelligence, and Dr. Sinha does as well. And everybody we talk to in India on legal matters is always, what about AI, right? And, and I, I also was on the board of, of Common Crawl, which is a, a crawl of the web that's available. And so 85% of ChatGPT3 was trained on the Common Crawl corpus. And so it's something I know a little bit about. I am not a fan of the conversational interface, the chat GPT, right? Ask me anything and I'll tell you lies. Um, and, and if you look at, at GitHub Copilot, which makes source code for you, right? You can say, write me a program. Uh, it turns out it's so buggy um, that you spend just as much time examining the source code that you got to figure out whether you know, it works or not. And I'm a big fan of one of the jobs as a teacher is to teach people how to learn properly. So even with the Wikipedia, you can use the Wikipedia, but you, know, you need to understand not everything in there is correct. Right? Um, and, and so I think LLMs have a serious issue. I, I think there's great potential. So we use AI to um, summarize court cases, to say this is the findings, right? This is the holding, these are the facts. Um, I use it to do optical music recognition. We have a project that takes sheet music and it scans it. It turns it into music XML and then creates a WAV file, right? And so we're able to take old sheet music, like. John Philip Sousa marches and turn them into something that you can hear. Now, we're not as good as the US Marine Corps band, um, but a lot of obscure music nobody's ever heard. And we're able, so we use AI to do that. And it's, it's a learning model that, that is able to recognize that. So I think AI has a lot of uses. Now, as to um, colonization of knowledge, I think we just need to stand up. Um, and I, I think people need to say that's not right. Uh, I think universal access to human knowledge is the promise of our generation. And that doesn't mean everything's available to everybody but a lot more needs to be available than is today, right? And, and so there are steps we can take to change the world, and it may not be that, that ideal utopia in the sky of, you know, everything is available to you no matter what, but certainly public safety standards, right? You know, uh, old literature in Canada that has never been scanned, uh, there's a whole bunch of things, and what we do is we target our efforts. We, we, we are opportunistic and we look for things that are available, that are important. And so we get a lot of people approaching us saying, oh, come visit our library. And you know, we'll, we'll look at them and say, well, this is interesting, but um, we don't think we can help you. You got too many books, and they're all modern, and you know, it wouldn't make a point. But when you see uh, Gandhi Bhavan Library or Lal Bagh, right? We, we heard that Lal Bagh was renovating its library. And that meant all, and we went and visited, and there were no books in there. I said, where are your books? Oh, we have them in a storage facility. So when is your renovation done? Oh, in six months. And we said, well, you know, can we scan your books while they're in storage? And, and one week later, this is government of Karnataka, we had a signed MOU and we had scanners on site. Right? We got three scanners over in, in a room and we're, we're, you know, we got a couple more months, but we'll have that done. That's an invaluable thing. And, you know, it hasn't seen the light of day. You could have gone to the library and seen the books, but now those books are going to be available to every horticultural researcher in India. And we're looking forward to the grand opening of, of the National Horticultural Library library, which is what it's going to be renamed when it opens. And we think maybe in February they might be reopening the building. And it's, it's a gorgeous facility. I mean, these are two heritage buildings. They have a museum and a library. Um, Ladbag itself is an amazing thing. Um, and we've been working with the joint director on, on scanning not only the books. Uh, they had a whole bunch of art prints, you know, like drawings of plants. And we scanned those at very high resolution so you can make posters out of them and things like that. They had a whole bunch of photographs on negatives and film, and we've digitized those. Um, so it's going to be a gorgeous library when it's all done. So. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the government of India making building codes open source. Uh, what do you think caused this change? And uh, can we be hopeful of similar shift in you know, people's thinking about open access across different geographies. So we did an RTI request after we, so they're not open source. When you download them, it says for non-commercial use only, yada, 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 don't change them. Uh, but they're, they're free. Uh, so we did an RTI, and there was an executive committee meeting of the Bureau. And uh, it turns out they briefed the secretary of the ministry. They were losing money, because even though their revenues had gone up, so, so did their expenses. And it was the secretary who said, I, I, I don't get it. You're losing money on this. Just give them away. Um, and, and 
Might that change? Sure, they, they, they could change and start charging again. Um, but I'm hopeful that, that they'll continue doing it. Um, and we still serve all the Indian standards up on the Internet Archive. And it gets millions and millions of views. I've also got them on, on my servers. And I get a million, million hits a month um, to the Indian standards just on my server. Um, so they're, they're much more. And not only that, when we were in court, we were like, I wonder who else is using these. And so we searched. Uh, you can tell there are standards for, you know, because they come from the Internet Archive. We found 40 government sites that had gotten the standards from us and were putting them online because they couldn't get them from the Bureau. Um, so Ministry of, you know, Construction and, and places like that. And so I, I think... I think that one is solid. Uh, the, the only caveat is the international standards, the International Standards Organization are not, and ISO cares a lot about, in fact, if, if you give away an ISO standard and you're a standards body, they kick you out of the International Standards Organization. It's part of their bylaws. You may not give these away under any circumstances. We think that's going to change with the European Commission decision because the European Commission has, in, has uh, over, I, I think it's close to a thousand ISO standards are EU law. And I think there's going to have to be an adjustment there, but it's going to require us going back into court. So, thank you very much. I appreciate your, your, your coming today. <laughs>